Well, it is seven o'clock, and uh, we do have a quorum of the board. Actually, we've lost Tracy. I lost Tracy. Uh, uh, I got Tracy back. Okay. So uh, we'll call the board to order. Uh, Hopkins, Giles, and Wyman are present. And thanks to those uh, members of the public who are also present with us tonight. So is there a motion regarding the agenda as it was posted? Can I move we adopt the agenda? Sorry. Okay, second, second from Tracy. Anything to be changed on the agenda? Any additions? Moving around of stuff doesn't sound like it. All in favor of adopting the agenda that was posted, say aye. 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 Unanimous. Item two, approval of the minutes of May 10th. Make a motion to approve. And I second. Any errors or omissions in the minutes as submitted? No, not that I could see. All right. All in favor of adopting the minutes as they were submitted, say aye. Aye. All right. It's unanimous. I think we have Selectman Coolidge on. That's great. Item three is the town manager's report. Uh, is, is Mr. Moore hosting or is Dave hosting? Mr. Moore's hosting? I'm hosting. Bill is our host. Great. Okay. So we can let Dave go on with his report then if we could. Thanks, Dave. Thank you, Bill. Um, so this is my report for the weeks of May 10th and May 17th. Uh, segment six sidewalk repairs, replacement continue on Grove, Grove Street and Conant Square. Um, and the crosswalk milling, sidewalk milling will start downtown this week. And crosswalk milling was done today out here by um, our office from across West Seminary and from both sides of seven right here. Um, and just another thing we can add on, we actually we've scheduled the final walkthrough for segment six for June 21st, uh, just to let you guys know. Um, Sean and I met with Rutland Regional Planning Commission on site at Long Swamp and Marshall Phillips Road to go over the ditch and drainage work. We will, we will be completing with the MRGP grant funds that we received last fall. Um, this work has to be done by October 23rd or something like that. So we're going to be, uh, we're going to be hustling to get that done. And that's all grant funded. Uh, attended the uh, May 18th Rutland Regional Planning Commissioners meeting. Um, we continued discussion on state highway project rankings. Not much going on in that meeting. Uh, attended the May 18th uh, VLCT webinar on the ARPA funds, which I did attach the slideshow in your, in your packets. Um, and we have some discussion on that later. Uh, held a pre-bid meeting for the Conant Square Park and Ride project on the 21st. And bid openings will be this Friday at 2 o'clock. We did have seven folks come to the, the pre-bid, which was mandatory. So that was, that was a good sign. Um, and we've started working on FY22 wastewater budget. So I'm presenting that to you guys at some point soon here. Uh, Rec Department news, the Brandon Carnival is back. M Miller Amusement called on May 20th to inform us they have squeezed in the town of Brandon for July 29th to August 1st for a midsummer treat. Stay tuned for all the details. We're patiently awaiting the notification of the Summer Matters Grant before releasing out summer camp schedules as it will greatly impact the pricing for residents. Uh, May 26 can't come fast enough, according to Bill Moore. The school has also indicated interest in helping to underwrite summer programming. What with their 20% of ARPA funding that is mandated to be used for summer and after school programming, we're hopeful they will look to partner with the REC. Uh, June 5th, Estewark Park will be hosting a craft fair to benefit the Brandon Dog Park, 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Spots are filling up. Please contact Karen Treya with interest. And we are partnering with the Brandon Area Toy Project to host a job fair at Central Park on Monday, June 7th from 5 to 7 p.m. We encourage local businesses to connect with local job seekers. Call Bill or Colleen with any questions. That is all I have for this evening. Thank you, Mr. Town Manager. Are there any questions for the Town Manager from the board? Uh, oh. How about from the public? I could, Dave, that's great uh, information. What, what day is the job fair? It is June 7th. Nope. Yes, June 7th. And uh, um, just as a aside, I've had a lot of, well, several constituents or businesses, you know, uh, worry they can't find employees. So I'm just wondering how, how Bill is reaching out to, empl to employers to see if they're interested in, in um, participating. There should be an advertisement in this week's uh, newspaper of note, the Brandon Pitzer Reporter, and then 
my plan is to, with all my free time, call each individual business wow. and make sure that they know about it as well. And hopefully having the chamber as well, reach out to their membership to let them know that this is happening. The school is already posted on their site. So hopefully we'll have some seniors that are part of this, which is really the reason why we timed it the way we did, because I think it's important, for, especially for some of these kids that do not have plans. There's an opportunity to uh, get some work locally. This is a great idea. Thank you so much for doing it. It's really, really important. <laughs> Thank you. Other questions for the town manager? Always time to ask Dave for input later on. So we'll go ahead and move through can I, that. Can I to just add one, one more thing, Seth? I'm sorry. Um, I know at a few meetings back, I think Doug Bailey actually brought it up about the speed signs that we have, the flashing ones. So we want to go install them. We have to have these certain poles. They're called breakaway poles. And they're getting a little hard to find. So Sean has ordered them. And when they get here, we'll be able to install them. But just wanted to give you guys an update because it was brought up at a board meeting a while back. Thank you. you. Remind me where those signs go, Dave. Um, I, I... Um, one goes kind of in the dip on the northbound lane on Franklin Street, like by the little purple house there. The yeah. other one is in the southbound lane up on Grove Street just before the Douglas house, kind of like right on the, the line there. Okay, thanks. Where the 25 mile an hour zone starts, basically. Uh, Dave, could I ask you, um, as part of your segment six tie-up stuff, um, do you have the bike racks on your list of things to follow up on? Did, did anything? I know I inquired about that last time, and I got to be honest with you, I forgot what Casella told me. Um, okay. I'll follow up on that tomorrow. Thanks. I think we've put a bunch of them out. I think the only one that's missing is the one by the bakery, but I will take a look. It was the, um, the cross pieces that I was asking about. Like you can yeah, see that you can see the frames, uh, but there doesn't seem to be anything to actually stick a bicycle to. I don't know if they if they are the ones that have like the individual sort of. But they must have of, something. I mean, I'll I'll take I'll look again. Yeah, Tim. Yeah, I just had a question, um, uh, Dave, on that um, June twenty first walkthrough. Is that you know kind of uh, the kind of thing I I might be able to tag along on, or is that something that really isn't you know a select board kind of thing? Um, I mean, it doesn't matter, but uh, it's me and Casella and Federal Highway and V-Trans. Um, if you want to take a stroll through town with us, you're more than happy to. Yeah, I'm just a little curious. Well, what time are you going to be heading out? I think 10 o'clock we're looking at. Oh, okay. Probably just start here at the town office. Thanks. Other thoughts for the town manager? Bernie Cock. I think the bike racks are made for like a bike on either side of those two uprights. I don't think they're made to have, like Dave said, I don't think they're made to have cross pieces in them. I seem to recall asking that question day back during the project. And I think that's what Casella said that was the style they're supposed to be. They've got, they've got drill holes in them is why I ask. But, but, but not very many. It looked like just like maybe one, was it more than that? No, it, but it looked like it was kind of ready to receive some other piece that was going to connect them or something. You know what I mean? Yeah. I don't think they do, Seth, but I, you know what? There should be a, um, a cut sheet and the plans for those bike racks too. So I'll take a look and see what we've got. Okay. How about public comment and participation? Items not on the agenda tonight anybody would like to bring up. We can do it now. You can comment on any of the agenda items as they come up. It's pretty informal. There's only 16 on the call tonight. So if something comes up later, you can raise your hand and we can uh, spend some time at that time. But Representative Jerome has a hand up at the appropriate time. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I just want to say thank you to everyone um, who's helped me throughout the session. It's been really a great to be able to call and um, get its advice and opinions um, from Bill and Dave and um, Chief Raquel uh, about issues that are going on uh, in the state house and, and different different bills. Sue also, uh, so I really appreciate it and Bernie too. And I and it's been um, it's really helpful for me to feel like I can call you and and get your um, your thoughts on on different issues. So sessions ended. We um, did some pretty amazing work, uh, even though it was on Zoom and that was a really tough scenario. And I think we all agree that we would rather 
be legislating in the state house than uh, in front of a camera. Um, so we the, the bills have gone off to the governor and it, the bills that didn't have time, a couple of bills that didn't have time to get to the floor were, were folded into the budget. So, um, and of, you know, note for my work were uh, those emergency recovery grants that go to businesses who, who didn't get, um, could, didn't get funding in 2019 because they were newer businesses and opened in 2019 or 2020. So there's some money out there for those businesses. Hope, um, and then uh, we worked on unemployment insurance and which is, you know, the, the trust fund fell from $500 million to $200 million. And so refunding that and sort of a fair and equitable way to businesses um, with a little bit of benefit for un the unemployed. And then also worked on some, um, uh, trying to bring new workers into Vermont with a little, a little bit of a uh, incentive for employers um, and help them with relocation packages. So, and plus there's, you know, a, a thousand and one things that have happened. Um, and I am going to have you holding two <clears throat> this week, next weekend, um, a constituent uh, coffee hour at the library from nine to 10 and then a, a follow-up one in Pittsburgh from 11 to 12. So I'll start doing those um, pretty routinely throughout the summer. And um, please feel, be in touch if you need anything. Thanks. Thank you, Representative Jerome. And uh, Town Clerk and Treasurer Sue Gage. I'm just chiming in with Stephanie. Um, one of the bills which has yet to be signed, I believe, um, um, is about voting and general elections will now, the Secretary of State's office will mail ballots to all voters for general elections. And, and that doesn't include primary, so it'll be just the November elections. And they'll, once the bill is signed, um, we'll have rules and I'll keep you all posted on that, but that's a pretty big change in our world. Thank you for that. Other public comment? Okay, let's go for the next one, uh, which is consider reopening in-person meetings. Was that brought uh, on the agenda at the request of anyone in particular, or does anyone wanna lead it off? I think we spoke about it the last meeting and we were going to bring it up uh, this meeting uh, with um, with the idea that the guidelines changing um, and, and with the possibility of continuing Zoom as an option for people that want to attend through Zoom that we could meet in person again, starting um, with our next meeting. Sure, so we did talk about the, that option. Does, uh, is there any update from the town manager or um, information technology czar regarding the capability of Zoom monitor and camera in an in-person board meeting? Um, Bill, you want to tell them what you told me today? Uh, yes. So we've we've uh, we've ordered uh, some equipment to go give this a go ahead and see if we can make this happen. I think we can. It doesn't seem terribly challenging. Um, we've got a nice plan. Uh, we have actually. There's been a TV that's been sitting on my wall for quite a long time that's never used that we're going to use as a monitor for uh, for everyone in the meeting. So the uh, Yes, we think we have a, a solution. Uh, the equipment is arriving this week. Dave and I are going to be testing it over the next couple of weeks, but I think that we've we've got it solved. So, you know, so it would allow it would allow for participation for people from home, and it would allow you guys to see who's participating from home, and will also you know get allow for people to participate obviously in person. Um, so it should work. Well, that sounds very good. good. Thank you for working on that. And uh, so it sounds from what you said that, you know, maybe by the 14th of June, you'll have had the opportunity to run it through its paces and see how it works. I think, I think that, I think it'd be a perfect meeting to try it on. I mean, in fact, maybe mm -hmm. we'll have a special meeting between now and then to, to look at working our way through a grant right now. We might need a letter of support from you guys. So we're going to figure out whether okay. we're going to make a deadline. So we might have a special meeting to give it a test. So. Okay, so what's uh, so given that report, which is kind of what we had um, left where we had left things last time, what's the pleasure of the board regarding uh, in person meetings? I'd make a motion that we go back to the in person meetings on June 14th, Tracy. Second, 
Yeah. Or the next, our next board meeting. Is that when it is the 14th? Yeah. Yeah. So there's a motion for Mr. Wyman and a second for Mr. Giles to resume in-person uh, board meetings, uh, beginning with the regular meeting of June 14th. And uh, we're doing that based on the information that there's also a Zoom capability um, going to be part of that so that people who are still not interested in meeting in person will be able to participate from home. Discussion. I, I wonder if we should come up with, um, you know, given the current state of, of COVID, um, just a set of guidelines for people that would want to come and attend the meeting. For example, if you're vaccinated, kind of like the grocery store, you don't need to wear a mask. But if you're, um, if you're unvaccinated, we, um, we ask that you wear a mask. Dave? Um, could I suggest that it shouldn't matter if folks are coming, they should probably wear a mask. And I know there's businesses that are still doing that just in case, so we're not putting folks on the spot and asking them whether they've been vaccinated or not. No, I, I wasn't suggesting we ask. Um, I just think it's um, it's a sign of the changing times we're in. That um, I mean, it, I'm seeing more businesses. I mean, both of the general stores that I attend, uh, or I, I frequent, um, have signs up now that say, if you're vaccinated, you don't need to wear a mask. And it's not that they ask you when you come through the door. It's it's not like they're checking. It's just that you know, it's just a, a it's a sign they put up to reflect the CDC guidelines. Um, I, I certainly don't think people should have to wear a mask if they're coming to the meeting, if they're fully vaccinated. Could I suggest that we see what the guidelines are then with how many folks in public meetings? And because I know right now there's, I'd have to look at the chart, but there's so many allowed that are not vaccinated versus who are, and I'm sure it'll change by the 14th. I, I'd be curious to see those numbers. The last um, uh, news broadcast that I heard from the governor um, on Friday with uh, Dr. Levine said that any number of um, vaccinated people can gather inside unmasked and uh, that there's no longer a limit on um, uh, vaccinated people um, gathering. But, but I'm certainly open to other information if you have other information than that. Um, no, I think we should just see what it says on the 14th before we make that decision by the 14th. Other input? Anybody got some information that maybe we don't? Yeah, Sue. Uh, well, the guidelines for state employees now is that um, they're they're just requiring masks for vaccinated for unvaccinated people, and they're not asking. They're just that's the signage on the doors. If you're unvaccinated, please wear a mask, and that's it. So they're no longer required at for state employees. Others with thoughts? So, um, so we've got the motion and the second to do this. Um, we've had some discussion about it. Do you want to um, make, you wanna make a decision regarding um, a policy about mask wearing at these meetings? You want to make that part of the motion? You want to make it a separate discussion? I I, I don't want, I don't want to make it part of the motion, but okay, all right, Let's, yeah, Dave. Seth, my only concern is is that we've been really good about following all of the guidelines that the governors put out for us, and I, right. you know, as like I said, it's changing rapidly, and you know, I think we should do whatever they're allowing us to do at that time, and not go above and beyond that just because we're starting to meet in public and all of us have been vaccinated. I, I think we should respect that the governor's orders and, you know, maybe it'll, everything will be opened up by then. Our numbers are looking really good with vaccinations and no new cases, but um, I really think we should just continue following the governor's guidance guidance. Well, that sounds fine. So would everybody be fine uh, with saying that we're going to resume in-person meetings on June 14th, and that uh, we will follow the then current state guidelines regarding masking. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think the reason why I even bring it up is because I wanted to avoid confusion for anybody who might want to be coming mm -hmm. to the meeting. And right. So I think that we're on the agenda. Um, you know, it makes sense that at the top of the agenda, when we have a location, we just list at that point, because that'll be on a Friday before the Monday, that we'll have, you know, the current, you know, best guidelines. So that's great. Does that sound all right to the board? But we're going to vote um, and say that we're going to resume the meeting with the then current guidelines regarding masking from the state of Vermont. Any further comments before we vote? Ready to vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 It's unanimous. Item six is to consider the ordinance uh, for the use of parks and recreation areas. And uh, we had this at the last meeting and we asked Mr. Atherton to make a few edits. Uh, Dave, do you wanna lead us through the results of that? Yeah, sure. I, um, I, I kind of cleaned a couple things up too. So um, there were some, just some, some words you wanted me to change like select board instead of what was there. Um, and definitions I did add a little bit more of the definition of a town park, just so everybody knew. Um, and then the restrictions, that first paragraph, um, we discussed doing it for like loitering or congregating after 10 and not just someone walking their dog. Um, and I think those were the only changes that were done. Yeah. That's it. What's the pleasure of the board regarding the ordinance that um, we looked at last time and that we asked Dave to edit and he's come back with the- I'd like, I'd like to make a motion to approve that as it was presented. Motion for Mr. Coolidge, is there a second? Second from right. Tracy Wyman. Any discussion on the ordinance as it's been revised since the last meeting? I just have one question, which I didn't notice until you just brought it up, Dave. When you have the definition um, often owned by the, um, the town, uh, are, are there any town parks not owned by the town? Well, it wouldn't be town parks. That'd be someone else's park. Well, exactly. <laughs> I, um, I agree. That's why I just think that that word often is, 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 um, is suddenly seeming superfluous. Uh, Tim, this is uh, Bill Moore, Rec Director. Um, so actually, it's interesting enough that I think it's good that we kind of have that definition. Um, we do have the possibility of a couple different landowners approach us about, uh, you know, the possibility of us leasing a park or leasing a piece of property for pocket parks or for temporary parks until they decide what they want to do with their land. So there are, there are parks that we will have or potentially have access to that won't be owned by us. Yeah, good point. Yeah. There's one on Franklin Street that I, I know about is, is coming into gear. So I see, thanks. Further discussion or public comment? None heard, ready to vote. All in favor of the ordinance regarding the use of town parks and recreational areas as presented in the packet, say aye. 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 That's unanimous, great. Dave, thank you for the extra work. No problem. That's what you pay me to do. <laughs> uh, number seven is the Energy Committee discussion. So um, I see we've got some members of the Energy Committee here tonight. Thank you for being here. Um, as far as introducing this, I think this is um, partly something that came from the Energy Committee or from members of the Energy Committee uh, looking for a little bit of direction because they've accomplished and we thank them for accomplishing the major task we asked them to do, which was the preferred solar siting. Uh, so we have some folks from the Energy Committee here tonight. Could I ask them if any of them has anything they'd like to lead off with in, in terms of this discussion about the future of the Energy Committee? Well, Seth, this is uh, Jack Schneider. Great. Thanks, Jack. Uh, we've currently been on, on hiatus for the last few months. We uh, continue to remain as a energy matters related subject matter experts for the town. Um, we are looking for some direction forward. Uh, 
uh, we have had discussions with the uh, Planning Commission, which is actually we're a subcommittee of the Planning Commission. They're at uh, eight members at the moment. I guess the state allows up to nine. Uh, one of the Energy Committee members uh, is currently on the Planning Commission. So I guess the question would be, do we remain on hiatus? Do we get uh, absorbed back into the Planning Commission? Do you want to add another member of the Energy Commission and move the, uh, and then you'd have two energy uh, experts on that commission? Thank you, Jack. Those are great options and uh, great background to where, where we're at. So I think this is pretty, pretty open-ended and pretty open-minded uh, discussion. I see Tim's got a hand up for a contribution. Yeah, um, I've been thinking about this some. It's, um, uh, I'm very interested in the subject and in the Energy Committee. And I, um, I was hunting around and I actually found uh, Montpelier has this net zero Montpelier. And I actually um, include it in the chat for anybody who's interested in looking at that. Um, and their um, purpose is to help um, Montpelier um, achieve the energy goals that Vermont has set. And I just saw it as an interesting parallel because they have, as part of their net zero Montpelier, they have something called an energy advisory committee. And um, it struck me that that's kind of what our energy committee could be. And, and I thought it would be useful if only to have it um, show up in our, our minutes so everybody can see it that um, currently Vermont's energy goals are, there's two of them. Um, the first is to meet 90% of Vermont's overall energy needs from renewable sources by 2050. And the second is to reduce Vermont's greenhouse gas emissions by 50% um, from the 1990 level by 2028 and reduce it by 75% from the 1990 level by 2050. Um, and if you want, Charlene, I can send that to you. <laughs> it would be helpful. Um, and the reason why I bring this up is because um, this is not just municipal numbers. This is really our whole community. And I think it would be profoundly useful to have an energy committee who was kind of you know, keeping track of um, how we're doing and helping come up with creative ideas for how we might reach these goals so the state can be successful. Um, it's, it's not something that this committee would have authority, so to speak, to force anything, but it would just make a, a lot of sense for them to be uh, keeping their finger on the pulse and um, keeping track of the numbers and um, helping us, you know, helping guide us along the way. So Tim, are you proposing that the Energy Committee take on uh, kind of a data gathering and analyzing role uh, among other um, things or? Yeah, among other things. I, I think that the data gathering is a big piece. I, I think the other thing is what they've partly been doing because as I understand it, they've been um, putting together some public outreach events to promote um, energy issues, whether it's um, electric cars or um, clean energy heating solutions or um, insulating your home. Um, and, and I think that it's possible them, for them to parallel this Montpelier Energy Advisory Committee in the kinds of outreach that they do um, or could do. And, um, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm not interested in, in limiting as much as I am trying to plant the seed that this group could actually be really helpful to our community. The, the folks who are on the energy committee who are on the call tonight, um, does anybody want to chime in with, with their thoughts about that idea? This is Edna. Can I make a comment? Is that acceptable? Please. Thank you. Yeah, that was the invitation. Yeah, thanks. Um, one of the great things about the energy committee that was, if I can describe it like that, is, is that it really became very proactive um, in terms of raising the profile of the need to take energy seriously and also to support the community in achieving that. Um, I think it would be a huge shame if we lost that, but its weakness, I think, is that 
a lot of activity can happen, but it has nowhere to go. So it needs some way of informing either the planning commission or the select board itself so that the information that's gathered and the good work that goes on isn't kept in a vacuum. Because I think, truthfully, that's basically how it has been. Um, when you think about what was achieved around the EV agenda, it would have been great to have had the um, celebration, and hopefully it could happen for the future. But it, those sorts of profile events make a big difference to Brandon and uh, the community itself. So if we can bring that back, that would be great too. Asking people to gather intelligence in terms of data, I think there would need to be a very clear steer to the committee about how that was done and how it was made sure that the um, information that was gathered is accurate and useful. So I'm curious about um, how the reporting would operate. Where does the Energy Committee take its expertise? Where does it take its information when it gathers it? Thank you, Edna. Um, I, th I think, you know, the default answer that comes to my mind is that it's been a, a subcommittee of the Planning Commission. So I would, I would assume that the concept was that the Energy Committee would kind of nudge the Planning Commission or, you know, encourage the Planning Commission in one direction or another. But I, I also recognize that not everything energy related is planning related. And perhaps, you know, the Energy Committee making a report every quarter, or twice a year or something like that to the select board or when it can, when it finishes a project or when it, um, you know, when it gets to a point where there's like a milestone in the project, um, you know, maybe, maybe it would talk directly with the select board. Certainly we can have interactions at any time. Okay. I mean, I'm grateful for that. It's just that um, there has been some amazing work done by others. I am not taking or claiming any credit for what has been achieved, but it has been pretty special, and it would be a shame to lose all of that valuable expertise and impact. Other thoughts from other folks? Could I say a few words? This is Matt Orchard here. Um, also a member of the Energy Committee currently. Uh, yeah, I would also just briefly strongly recommend that uh, the Energy Committee isn't diminished in any way. Uh, I, I think we all can recognize that we have a large number of environmental challenges that are going to be facing our community, both locally and as a state into the future. And, and having a dedicated group of people that has been engaged in this conversation and in advocacy work around you know, supporting, uh, telling our community to, to be more mindful of their environmental decisions and choices can only be a benefit. So uh, I would hope that the Energy Committee is able to stay with, within its current size and be given a, a strong mandate by either the Planning Commission or by the town so that we have a strong direction in, into the future as far as making decisions and, and, and deciding how we can best act and how we can best support our community. Thanks. Thank you. Other comments? So I'm just looking at the list of the Energy Committee members. If it's current on the town website, we actually have a quorum of the Energy Committee here tonight. It appears we have only four members on the Energy Committee right now. Does that sound right, uh, those, who are, those who are here? Uh, that's correct. Yeah, okay. So uh, we have Edna and Matt and Jack, and then the other uh, listed member is Lowell uh, Rasmussen, who is also a Planning Commission member. Mm -hmm. So uh, we've got, we've got, uh, we've heard now from the three energy committee members who are here, and we've heard from a couple of select board members. Uh, from some further comments, town manager have anything to weigh in or any other members of the public? No, I have nothing to weigh in, Seth. Okay. So what's the pleasure of the board for proceeding? Looks like they're looking for some direction. I think they've, um, made some requests about, you know, not wanting to work um, and then have, have the result basically not go anywhere. And I think that that's a reasonable request. People are volunteers. 
uh, and they're volunteering their time and their expertise, and uh, certainly that that deserves consideration. So I think we need to um, figure out some kind of process or um, reporting regime where they, they know kind of what we're asking them to do. They can do their own projects um, and also they'll know that there'll be some response to, to the work that they're working on. If, if we're looking for something um, specific, a, a, a set of mandates or a set of, um, of you know, goals for the year, um, I, I'd be willing to uh, pencil something up for the next meeting to, um, to pass um, if it would be helpful. Um, and I would, what I would do is I would go research a couple energy groups, energy committees in the state to find out um, the kinds of things they're doing and um, possibly um, put that into a format that would be um, something we could pass as a motion because I'm not prepared to give that right now. Yeah, I, it's, I think that would be helpful, others? I, I would agree with Tim. I mean, I just, it'd be helpful to have, if he was willing to do that, that would be fantastic. Do you want to do that, uh, Tim, in conjunction with anyone on the Energy Committee now, or do you think that's not necessary to... Um, well, I, I would certainly love to have, um, you know, people who are here tonight, Matt and Jack and Enda, um, just say whether they, they think that's a good idea, and, and perhaps um, one or more of them would like to... Um, you know, to work with me to come up with these these goals and um, and the list. Well, I think that's a great idea. I I would agree with that. I think there's a good model already in the Energy Committee that could be used as the base, and then if there's good ways of developing it from there, I think that would be excellent. Okay, so I think at this point, um, we can just proceed on the consensus of the board that Tim and Jack uh, are gonna collaborate and come up with a, a proposal to bring to the board at a future meeting that will talk about um, what the goals and responsibilities of the Energy Committee are and uh, how its reporting structure will be. Does that sound good? Great. All right, thank you very much. Thank you to the Energy Committee I will say for, for taking the initiative about this. Um, I, th I think that we have heard, as I said, from at least two of them, uh, basically wanting to be useful and uh, wanting to engage with uh, the select board and the planning commission in the most appropriate way. And uh, I, I appreciate that very much. And I think that when we have community members who are, are willing to give of their time and knowledge, um, I, I, I appreciate it. And I think it is for the for the betterment of the community. So thank you all for serving to this point and thank you for your willingness to continue serving and to bring to the board uh, the need for some more clearly defined um, goals and responsibilities. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else to be said about energy matters before we go along to the next item? Okay, we'll go along to item eight, which is ARPA fund discussion. And uh, we do have some info that Mr. Atherton has provided to us in the packet from the VLCT, but I'll, I'll let him go ahead and introduce it. So I attended a webinar that the, that the league did last week on the latest and greatest on the ARPA funds. Um, actually, this was pretty good. It, it guideline what the, what the funds could be used for, um, which is included in this packet that I, the slideshow that I gave you. Um, a couple of the, criteria which i thought were helpful was that if it was a prod they were they're really looking at and there's some other things too but water and wastewater upgrades and things like that and if as long as it was something that could be brought to state you know the drinking water or clean water revolving loan fund then it would be an accepted uh yeah accepted uh i'm drawing a blank on words project for uh to spend arpa funds on so um, I hope the more, the more we learn about this, the more we really look at putting money into our wastewater treatment plant and its collection systems. Um, I, I have spoken with Wayne Elliott on a few things on just some of the other stuff that was in our, if you remember our, um, evaluation report that they did last year for what we used to get the bond money on. There were some other things like we've got some 
some lines that are taking some infiltration in. We've got the Newton Road pump station. Uh, we could use this for water and sewer, you know, which would be kind of nice. Maybe we do that to help out the fire district on Union Street uh, in connection with like our sidewalk grant. We got to kind of do that complete streets there. So just wanted to get this in front of you guys to see what's going on because it has been really kind of confusing. And, you know, I'm, Stephanie and I have talked about it a few times as well, trying to figure out what the heck's going on. So I think they're getting closer and maybe Stephanie knows a little more than I do today. Um, but I'd, I'd really like to see us, you know, it's up to you guys, but it'd be really nice to be able to put this into our wastewater system. I, uh, I wanted to thank Dave for taking that webinar and also for um, the general direction that he's thinking. Uh, I think it's very important that uh, whatever this ARPA funds turn out to be for the town, I, I think it's very important that we ensure that the widest possible uh, section of the community receives the benefit from it. So I, I like the idea of infrastructure improvements. I think infrastructure improvements do tend to be super beneficial to the community as a whole and to the largest number of people in the community. So I thank you for, for bringing that up, Dave, as a, as a lens to look at this uh, through. Sure, Seth. So one of the other things that we wanted to look at, which I, I think I kind of spoke to you guys before when we heard there might have been a, a pot of money coming our way, was to have some shovel-ready projects, which is why I've sort of been working on this Union Street thing, because, you know, there's plenty to do there. Um, and we have, like, the Newton Road, the Newton Road pump station has been evaluated. We did it way back may, with the possibility of maybe doing FEMA funds at one time. So, you know, there's some more money out there for those other things, but um, you know, and, and I think that that performance evaluation that, again, the A&E did is really going to be really helpful in us getting funds because we sort of have already diagnosed the problem and know what it needs to, to fix it. So um, more to come, hopefully. Uh, other thoughts on this? Other input? Reactions? Tim? Yeah, I, I had a couple of things that I, I was really interested in. Um, the when I look at page 31 in this packet, it talks about um, you know wastewater projects, which you just mentioned, and um, and I'm curious if any of this ARPA money can be used in our wastewater treatment plant um, project that's kind of shovel ready and starting to move forward. No. No, it cannot. It can't be used because we've already gotten funding for it, so it can't be used as a match. Okay. Um, yeah. So no, unfortunately. And, and I, I certainly was interested in the infiltration aspect because that's always fascinating me that um, we have as much water getting into the system that's not specifically wastewater. That's um, and and I love the idea that we might be able to have some money to chip away at that. And when you mentioned infiltration a moment ago, that would be um, interesting. Well, we we have you know we have a couple a couple spots where you have houses that are close to rivers and the water level is really high, so there's that has a lot to do with it. Um, across from like the police station, we have that wetland area that drains really slow, um, if you've noticed after storms. So we know there's some infiltration going on there. So, yeah, and we did that, you know, if you guys remember back, we, we slip lined that the big sewer main that goes up uh, behind like McDonald's or not McDonald's now, Jiffy Mart up through Park Village. So that took a lot of inf our infiltration out, but there's still more. We got 22 miles of line. So. Um, you know, we're chipping away at it, which is good. Well, and the other word that jumped out at me on that page 31 was cybersecurity. And I'm curious if there is some ARPA money, um, you know, cybersecurity is something I, I, I get the feeling, you know, we could strengthen, you know, we could be better at. And it's a one of those current, um, I mean, the reason it's in this <laughs> document is because it's, um, it's something many, many towns face. And I, I wonder if we might think about using some ARPA money that way. And then the, the last thing that I um, came up with as I was looking through this, um, the, uh, all the documents you sent, is on page 48, it says, you know, what select board needs to do. And it says appoint a representative. Um, and can I assume, Dave, that you're our appointed representative who's um, leading the way on this ARPA um, information? It sort of seems that way by default, so I don't, you know, I don't mind doing it. 
Not at all. Do, do we need to specifically um, make a motion and appoint you? I mean, it seemed like that's what was it implied. If you look at that page 48 and it says, what should select boards do? And it says appoint a representative. If you want to. <laughs> well, there's a lot of towns that don't have a town manager or town administrator. So I'm sure they're looking for someone to be their point person where I sort of am by default anyway. But okay, okay, if, you guys, if you want to do it, go ahead. Go ahead and do it, Tim. Yeah, well, I, I make the motion that um, that Dave be our authorized representative is what they refer to in the document here. Is there a uh, second? Second from Tracy. Discussion on appointing David Atherton as town manager to be the authorized representative for the ARPA funds. All in favor say aye. 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 It's unanimous. Thank you very much. Well, and on that same page, um, it talks about public engagement um, that they encourage the select board to do, discuss priorities and options. And it is kind of interesting, just historically, to think of the level of this kind of money flooding into our state. Um, it's it's, it's a, a huge opportunity. And as you just so eloquently stated, Seth, it's something that everybody should feel um, part of, you know, everybody should feel like they're benefiting from this um, infusion um, of, of cash. And, and so um, the point they make in this document, it seems, is that there should be some effort at public engagement to talk about priorities, possibly to, to lay out a, a menu of options that we could then, you know, see where people's interests lie. Um, I mean, I'm not trying to usurp the authority from, you know, clearly some direction we're already getting from Dave appropriately as to where projects need to be done and, you know, priorities. But it does seem like a great opportunity to engage the public in, um, in feeling part of this. I, I would concur, Tim. I do think that I would want to be sure of two things before I were to call a meeting like that. And the two things would be, what is the number? And on what can, we, can it be spent? You know, I, I don't think it will be useful to say, let's have a meeting next Monday about ARPA funds. And we'll get a lot of well-intentioned people with very good ideas that might be totally not appropriate uses of this kind of funding. And, and we won't know even in fact, you know, what kind of, are we talking about, you know, $3,000 or are we talking about $3 million kind of thing? So I, I'd like us to be sure that we at least have some, uh, parameters to give to the people who might be interested in coming to such a meeting. Oh, I've said something that's got hands flying from looking forward to hearing more, them. more so, sophisticated it's, it's, and uh, informed people than me. So why don't we start with Representative Jerome and then uh, let Dave take a stab if his hand is still up. Uh, actually, one of my questions is for Dave is if we've gotten the, if you received the final number on what, what um, brands can receive. Okay. Yeah, you know, at one point there was some discussion about the county money versus the town money and how that was going to, because we don't have much of a county government like other places in the, in the country that the county funds would go directly to this towns. So I was just wondering if you'd heard about that. No, is what I've heard is this is getting, this is being distributed in two installments, like yep. one this year and then one like next spring, yep. but now they're trying to use like the regional planning commissions to be sort of the project managers behind right. it. So this is kind of something new. You know, we haven't, again, I think a lot of that is helpful for small towns who don't have a, you know, a de public works department or town manager or whatever, where we're yep. kind of doing this every day. And um, that's my understanding is that that's, that is their role to help the towns who don't, don't have a, a solid administration. Right. So then the other thing I was just going to add into that, which I had my hand up for, but, this does not cover paving projects. So if we do a water and sewer project that we tear up the road and have to pave, then yes, but we can't just go pave every dirt road in town with ARPA money, just to let you folks know. Yeah, and I, and I appreciate Dave being really cautious about this money because there are pretty strict guidelines. I, right a few days before the legislature ended, I received a, had a, um, briefing from one of the legis one of the attorneys in the state house about about this and and you know we had to be really careful about Dave's right really careful about how you're going to spend this because god forbid you spend it in the wrong way and have to pay it back so you know there, you have to be cautious about exactly meeting the criteria on um for the funds i think but, all of our fema work has led us up to this because they were so strict with their guidelines and 
everything that this, it just kind of feels similar to that. So. Yeah. That, and, and, you know, at, with all the legislation that was going on this, um, this year and last spring um, with the CARES Act money and the ARPA money, like, like Vermont was, has been so cautious about spending this money in the appropriate way and, and not wanting to be caught um, ha having spent it incorrectly and, and having to, to pay it back. So um, it, one of the nice things about this money is that it's, it's about three and a half years now before it has to get spent. So I think, a, you know, a logical, plan, like what Seth was saying, like, you know, wait and sort of like, see how this all fleshes out. So you can really see where the best, where you can get the most bang. You, know, you want to get the most bang for your bunk, buck. It's like, a, it's a tremendous amount of money and you want to do the most you can for our community. So I think it's wise to sort of take it a little bit on the slow side and make sure you've done it right. Excellent. Uh, thank you both. Other comments or discussion at this time? I, I, I certainly Jim, you drew in a breath, so go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> I was just going to say, I, 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 I've been looking through the slides that Dave sent, and um, it looked like a really great um, uh, seminar he went to. And because they talk about um, encouraged um, activities and um, trying to look at, um, but, but they, they also talk about how there's two chunks of money coming out, and they mentioned May 2021 as the first half coming out and the second half coming out later. And it seems like if they're talking about May 2021, that's only seven more days. And and I just would, um, I, I certainly want us to be, as they say in here, deliberate and patient um, and strategic. Um, but I, I just would hate for us to somehow miss out because we didn't, um, you know, get in there and, and, and make a request. Dave. So there was, I'm already set up through the treasury, it's treasury.gov. It was quite an extensive setup. I actually called Stephanie to see if it was really legit because they wanted like facial scans and like your social security number. It was kind of creepy. So I, we're all set up in the system and I've checked it like every few days I check it to see if you can actually make the submit a request button work yet and it's not working yet. So um, when it does, I assume that's when we'll be able to um, start a project sheet or whatever they're going to do. So I'm, I'm keeping an eye on it. Um, That's great to know. Thank we're you. ready to go when they're ready to write us a check. So, Well, and that's why I think engaging the community, if we, if we really, it seems like that piece has to be in gear before we even can ask for money. Um, and, and I think that's why I'm encouraging us to start having some kind of public outreach of some kind. Um, well, we're sort of doing it right now, aren't we? So oh, it is true. Doing. No, I, I agree. This is definitely serving that purpose. I mean, I notice I'm um, here on, on the slide, page 24 in our packet. It said, um, encouraged expenditures, categories including racial disparities, inequities, and disproportionate harm. I mean, it, it starts to open up, I think, interesting conversations about, you know, what parts of our uh, community were the most um, <clears throat> harmed through this COVID experience and, and how might we... Um, do something for the largest number of people who are have the greatest need. Um. Any further comments, response? I think it's kind of an under advisement um, stage at this time, I really. This is the sense I'm getting. Okay. Uh, but thank you for the um, for the big background and for this initial discussion. As as you all pointed out, this is kind of the initial kind of sounding board discussion. So we'll expect some more of these kinds of conversations as we get some more specifics to talk about. If that sounds good, we'll we'll move on to item number nine. Uh, consider downtown Wi-Fi network. Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi. Um, Seth, if, I'd like to pass this over to Mr. Bill Morick. So he has very good speaker here tonight. So very good. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Seth. Thank you, Dave. Um, I'm Bill Moore. I work for the town of Brandon, doing recreation, economic development. I've I've talked to you guys 
a couple different times about this uh, master plan around uh, creating a downtown uh, wireless fidelity network. And I'm really excited that we uh, have here tonight uh, a gentleman by the name of Justin McCourt, who works for a company called Up and Running IT. And he and I spent spent a lot of time over the last couple of years actually working together. Uh, he helped install uh, some state funded uh, state funded wireless uh, access point on the town hall. That's been actually fairly robust. And when we spoke, uh, he talked about the possibility of creating a network downtown. Uh, and again, that was I think April or May of last year. Uh, you know, now that we've had an opportunity to sort of walk around downtown and look at some of our spots and look at what we could possibly provide for a, a backbone for this wireless network, um, we've come up with a plan. I'm going to share my screen. I shared with the uh, select board the uh, the packet, the the proposal in a map, which is black and white. It looks a lot better in color. Let me uh, share the screen. It's up now. Can everybody see it? Give me a thumbs up if you can see it. Excellent. So this is the downtown, as you notice. Here's Hannaford. Um, the purple is the network. These green dots are where I'm going to put up the map legend so you can kind of see. They, these are uh, where we would put wireless access points to cover this downtown area. And this is where I'm starting to get a little out of my field. But I'll be putting Justin on shortly to sort of clean up anything I might mess up. Um, I guess the most important takeaway is that, you know, this purple area roughly is what would be covered by these, uh, by these access points. This would create this mesh network that would have some redundancy built in by way of us um, establishing, we would switch over to a, a fiber line in the town hall, town offices. That'd be back fed by a, a gigabyte service uh, from hopefully from Vermont telephone. They connected to us last year as a part of the, as a part of their wireless initiative, they put a wireless hotspot on the front of the town hall and dropped fiber, which I didn't know was in the middle of the downtown, which is fantastic. Uh, we're very excited. Um, but so we would have a, a one gig um, back feed there. We would have some some coverage of a back feed in the Stephen A. Douglas or the I'm sorry, the Brandon Museum. I think they're trying to repurpose that or you know, re relabel, rebrand it, the Brandon Museum. Uh, formerly, formerly the Stephen A. Douglas House, um, in a back feed with the public library as well. So there again, there would be some redundancy in the coverage area. So if any one of these networks were to go down, we'd have some, we'd have some coverage. And that's about the extent of my technological uh, knowledge. But this is, I mean, we, we, I, I reserved money last year from my economic development budget, just you know, thinking about planning for this. Um, I would strongly encourage the select board to consider funding this and potentially using ARPA money as this does fall under broadband uh, to pay for this network. And with that, I'd open the floor to any questions that Justin will answer. Or Daphne's silence, whatever is your Bill, preference. Bill, is, <laughs> Bill, is this, um, is this, is the wireless those area is that basically the down the designated downtown as well it's just yeah just about almost i mean it doesn't go quite up all the way up seminary to the old brandon high school but this is this is almost yeah it's actually okay. hilarious yeah um and the other thing i was wondering is like i know that in the budget there's 150 million dollars for broadband to go to the, directly to the cud so i was wondering if some portion of that might be able to be used for this. I know there's other, and I know there's other broadband monies scattered throughout the budgets too, the budget and the different bills this year. I'm hoping something might be able to. So, so, so I feel like now I would have to change my name on the screen and change it to Bill Moore, comma, Otter Creek Communication Union District Chairman. <laughs> And know that like that money is for the entirety of our our communication June district yeah. and not just Brandon. And if we you know, the right now, what we're uh, where we're at with our communication June district is that we are uh, we've just applied for more grant money to fund a high level design. Um, so then we can get our business plan complete and figure out where we're going to build first. And I almost I can I would be I'm safe to say that it probably won't be downtown Brandon. Um, uh, especially with the the fact that consolidated plans on coming down through here with with, uh, with fiber, you know, we will be looking to build in some of the spots where um, 
where services is just non-existent, where people are critically or tragically underserved. And, right. you know, while there might be, you know, little hiccups here and there within downtown Brandon, we're certainly yeah. not one of those areas. So but it's that, that, absolutely, and it's absolutely, this is absolutely the, the a step in the, in the right direction as far as economic development is concerned. And I love, I love it. I think it's great. I should be really, this is wonderful. Congratulations. Tim. Tim Giles. Well, I, have, I have a question for Justin, a couple, um, actually. What kind of speeds can we expect um, when we're using this um, in town? All of these acts, can you guys hear me? Yes. Good. So all of these access points, um, when they're configured, the ones that you see that are green on the screen are gateways. That means they'd be connected to a source of internet or connected directly to the internet on a host. Um, depending on whatever the internet service provider plan is that the host has, we can segment and create quality of service rules to provide any speed allowable. So if they had gigabit service, we could serve the public with gigabit. Usually we provision and segment off a certain amount of bandwidth to protect the host's internet connections. In the case of the library, they would most likely be the ones sharing uh, whatever bandwidth they have because that's their mandate. But for others, such as a church or uh, I believe we have Foley Tacos and we have all these other locations as well as Town Hall, we would need to protect the bandwidth considerations for the people hosting these access points with both electricity and internet. So you could get anywhere between five megabits per second for a download speed, five megabits up, which would supply you with the ability per client to do a Zoom call. The Zoom calls that we're on right now depend on anywhere between two and seven megabits per second, upload and download. Um, most of these video calling applications are very good at scaling. So some of the quality changes as you know, you guys are all aware of this, the quality gets better and worse depending on what, uh, it can, it can fit through the stream. Um, in order for this to be a value add for the community, you would need to have sufficient bandwidth to, to, to fund the network. So these connections usually are depending on a Comcast connection or a, uh, in some rare cases, possibly a VTEL connection. Comcast's upload bandwidth is limited. We all know this, uh, even their gigabit plan they have a thousand megabits of download uh, available to their clients. The upload bandwidth is only 35 and that's the highest tier they offer. Um, so looking at it from a, a value add perspective, download is what people are gonna want. They wanna download maps, they wanna do email, they wanna do connectivity things. Maybe, you know, watch a YouTube video, whatever it is, that's a value add for your community. If you're gonna look at it as a, serving the public, you'd need to somehow arrange for at least each client would want to be have an upload bandwidth between 15 and 25 megabits per second so that you could have people come into town and do telehealth calls or zoom calls if we ever have another situation like this so well, I, I i think that's that that's where i'm interested that that's where i'm interested in is, is yeah. understanding because um I, I, it, it seems like um there's there's a quite a lot of people within this this boundary that will be close enough so they can use this from their home. Um, I know there's there's several apartment buildings in that um, that area, and there's certainly a lot of you know businesses. Um, and I mean, I, I I'm I'm a supporter of believing in providing public internet, but it seems like as you just pointed out, you have to supply the bandwidth. And right. And I'm wondering if there's been any analysis on likely usage, you know, because of the um, residential nature that's being yep. there and, and thus yep. how much bandwidth we have to buy. First, it was the ISPs who were very concerned that they would be losing market share. And then it was the people donating the Internet, the concern that, you know, somebody's in a housing, uh, whatever apartments would be using it and not paying for their own Internet. We have ways to filter the protocols so that they can't watch Netflix. They can use YouTube and at a limited rate, and then we can play with all kinds. We've seen tons of metrics for this stuff. Uh, over time, it's become kind of a non-issue. I think people really want to have good internet. They'll pay for good internet. And if it's good enough to use and a public service, then that's what they use it for. And typically, the downtown areas, there is some overlap with what you're suggesting, like people that live in the downtown areas 
usually have their own internet connections. It tends to be used almost exclusively by visitors. You can see statistics on the dashboard. Um, there's, a, there's a lot more technicality to, to the, the part that I'm gonna dip into, but there's a dashboard. All of these devices are cloud managed. So they're all connected to a controller where you can see in real time, the communications going in and out. You can see what the, the, the traffic is, where the traffic's going, how much, but you can't see what it is. So you can't like look into people's computers, you can't see it, but as far as viewing what the statistics are, what kind of traffic's being used, um, you can tweak it. So if you see a lot of people sitting around watching Netflix, you can slow down the, the Netflix protocol so that they just stop using it because it, it basically sucks and doesn't work. And uh, you can leave it open for things like YouTube, which is what we've done and had pretty good success protecting and, and maintaining standards that make it usable. Um, yeah, I, I, I think this is the part that I'm really interested in. I, I mean, I have a friend who lives in Bristol and apparently they have um, some public Wi-Fi there that's just very, very bad. And so nobody ever uses it because it's, you know, useless. And yet, you know, we all travel, we go through airports, many, many airports have brilliant Wi-Fi. I mean, right. you can sit in an airport and watch movies and, you know, do um, Skyping and, and Zooming. And, yeah. and I guess I'm just really curious as to being sure we understand how much it's going to cost to provide really good internet. Because I want people when they come to Brandon to be impressed and to say, wow, these people do internet right. Yeah, I would, I, would, the charging station. <laughs> I would suggest that you have a communication. So the people who are who are going to support your, your network here, if you guys could subsidize their internet connections and bring it up to the gigabit connection, then you will be able to do that. You could create a very, very robust network. I mean, there's two components of it. There's the network that we create with the devices themselves. And then the, where the where does it go? I mean, in between all these access points, you can have phenomenal speeds up to two gigabits per second. Um, if you don't have a good internet connection, then that's a problem. And the folks in Bristol, um, so over the last year, I worked with the Department of Public Service and installed 197 access points in about uh, a little under that. We put a couple in some towns, in about 195 towns in Vermont. I drove 40,000 miles in the last nine months and never left the state of Vermont. Um, the biggest problem was always getting a source of internet to be able to, to go ahead and, and do that. So, I mean, it really does depend on it. And I, I mean, that might be a question that you'd want to look at to find out whether or not you guys can help subsidize the costs for these people. <coughs> I think it needs to be part of the conversation. Um, and, and my best example is the... Um, the charging station. You know, when you go into a charging <coughs> station and you have to be there for a half hour, forty five minutes, yeah, you, know, you really want to be able to do full internet things um, at high speeds, you know, and and possibly do some work from your car. You know, it's like to make those charging stations attractive, you want full speed internet, and <coughs> uh, I, I would expect it to compete with anybody's home internet, you know, quality. That would be difficult to deliver that service. Um... It would, again, it would just depend on what you have for supply. Um, can we meet out the demand? Absolutely. If you propose to build a, an infrastructure like this in a public area, you would be able to deliver as fast as whatever you can get. So again, it's going to depend on what your backhaul, the, the technical term for that is backhaul. So your bandwidth, your backhaul really dictates what you're allowed to disseminate to the public. And right. that's, that's the nature of the beast. So like if you have a Comcast modem at a at one of these people who's hosting one of these access points, and they have a sit you know, they have a service with 300 megabits uh, download speed and only 12 megabits up, it could very you know very quickly bottleneck that upload bandwidth and and create a problem for them using the network. Not to mention the hosts who are actually dependent on it for their business or their their municipality or whatever it is. So you've got to take that into account. Dedicated dedicated sources for the internet for the public Wi-Fi versus sharing some of the internet bandwidth of, of a local business or a municipality's connection. It's, it's really up to you how much you want to fund the project. 
But the, the way, what I do is I design these networks and build these things so that you can, you can deliver that bandwidth once you have it. So if you were to purchase bandwidth at a gigabit level from somebody like VTEL or Consolidated or somebody like that, we can build a mesh network that would be very, very, very fast. And you would have that kind of, you know, like you mentioned an airport. Is that the hardware that you're talking about installing with this current quote we see in front of us? Oh, absolutely. Yes, These, this is an enterprise networking system that's basically capable of putting out uh, multi-gigabit speeds wirelessly if the devices are capable of using them. It's actually Wi-Fi 6. Um, it's 802.11ax, which is arguably going to be the last form of Wi-Fi that we use. As I said, it's multi-gigabit. So really the bottleneck ends up becoming where you travel over the wide area network or the uh, internet service provider's connection. That would be the, the only limiting factor. We could serve thousands and thousands of clients on this simultaneously if it were the case. I don't think we could muster that many people in your downtown area, but it would be possible to do it. If we pass this, how soon could you install it? I am in the parking lot of a FedEx facility right now, picking up fiber optic transceivers to do the projects that I am currently engaged in. I would say late July would be a, an optimistic, uh, an optimistic guess. I mean, it's just it's been extremely busy. Uh, connectivity has blown up as a as a uh, priority for everybody in Vermont, especially because we were underserved yeah, for thanks. decades. So. I am, I am flat out, but as soon as possible, I would say, you know, within a month, maybe a month and a half, six weeks out, I could get something up and running out there. The planning is really what matters. If everybody's ready for us to come in and do it, we could build it inside of a week. What's the cost of that after every year after the initial setup? Each access point contains a license that keeps it running. Each access point requires a license. And so if you buy the licenses per year, you can buy them in multi-year, you can buy them uh, up to 10 years at a time. The price obviously goes down for the access points licensing. And that's what allows you to have access to the controller and the dashboard that allows you to uh, regulate and moderate and control the entire networking system. Um, the cost for one access point, I mean, bear in mind, MSRP values are available on the Meraki website. You can actually go there and look at a cost calculator. I can actually, give me just a second, I will go ahead and I will send Bill a link that he can share. And we will go ahead and do that. There, Bill. Are you there with me, bud? I'm here. <laughs> Can you hear? Can everyone hear me? Sorry, I, I got an email it distracted me. The uh, I'm, I'm a terrible at... Zoom user. I have to be really honest with you guys. I'm uh, you down with the teams. Yeah. Well, I've I, I've had to actually be in person for all of the last year. I had to go out and meet all the people in person. So I never I never got to use Zoom. I didn't get to stay home. I had to wear a mask and travel around the state of Vermont for uh, ten months straight. And, and I think Brian's question has to do with this licensing. And I see on your estimate here, you show $450 for six five-year um, uh, licenses. Correct. And so, um, you know, five years, that's $90 a year um, per access for six point. of them. And so it comes out to be, what, about $15 per access point per year? Per, uh, I'd have to take a look at that. That sounds like it would be fifteen dollars per month if you broke it down. It was four hundred fifty dollars for a five-year so license. Four hundred fifty per for for six units, though. Oh, well, I see. No, I see. Okay, right. That's the unit price. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it ends up being something like yeah, anywhere between depending on how far you push it out. I think it becomes as low as uh, twelve dollars if you buy a seven-year license. It starts at 150 for one year, 300 for a three year. I, I think the other part of, of Brian's question, though, has to do with the um, cost of the bandwidth, because I think that'd be the thing that I'd be interested in trying to get numbers on is the different size bandwidths that we might choose to buy, which would affect the quality of our service. And yep. 
and that'd be an ongoing cost that I think Brian's right to, you know, bring up. And absolutely, uh, the ongoing cost for bandwidth. Well, I, I thought it was directed solely at the hardware solution and the 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 network that you guys are going to run to disseminate the internet. But if you guys were looking at prices for Comcast, I think there's something like ninety to one hundred and twenty dollars per. Uh, gigabit connection per month is 100, about 120 bucks a month for Comcast. And that's the highest level one they have. Uh, so that would be the, the highest recurring cost by far. Um, if done correctly, there's no reason why we couldn't have one of the repeaters, one of these access points not be a gateway. It can be a repeater so it can hop. So you could use one internet connection in order to fund to, to supply internet for the other two that are in line with it within sight within range. So it's not necessary to make each one a gateway. However, what we did was design it with the idea that if you spread out the bandwidth required and have each one of them be a gateway, then you're kind of lessening the burden of one single internet connection to, to supply them all. Um, we found that to be successful in places like uh, Bennington, Brattleboro, um, Woodstock, uh, basically supply the more gateways you have the more sources of internet you have to divide it up by so but it always helps to have each gateway have as much internet access as possible the highest bandwidth possible that's always the limiting factor agreed yep and when vtel rolls through a town and installs all these these uh gigabit you know symmetrical connections that really enables you to do incredible things outdoors with wi-fi for public mesh networks i mean gigabit connections especially the upload bandwidth is is pretty critical especially for stuff like this which has become the de facto method of communication and, and oh sorry to interrupt just and i said we are, we are in negotiations and almost let's settle on a price for for gigabit service from vtel here at the town offices to backhaul this connection, so. Consolidate is supposedly gonna deliver fiber to the curb by this time next year uh, through whatever markets they're in in Vermont, that's their plan. So if it, it remains to be seen whether that will materialize or not, but that is their goal. And they do have the infrastructure, the backbone to do that, but that's as much as I know about it. So Seth, can I um, make a motion to um, um, accept this estimate and to um, uh, move forward with the purchase of this and the installation of the hardware? Could you, you certainly can make the motion. Is it made? Yeah, I make the motion that we accept the estimate that's included in our packet, which includes the purchase and installation um, and uh, support for um, the Wi-Fi system. Is there a second? I'm going to give it a second for discussion and ask for some input from the town manager. So <clears throat> what I'm hearing is there's hardware to buy. And then what Brian asked about was, you know, the, the carrying costs basically. So if, if the number is $120 a month or so times six gateways times 12 months, we're talking about $8,640 a year of internet service. Um, is the town manager have any view about where that might fall in the budget? And does he have a recommendation about whether that's um, a good fit? Um, I think this is all in good and fine and dandy, but as these numbers are going in front of me tonight, I'm starting to wonder where we're going to pull the funds from. So I would really like to have a further conversation with Bill and maybe possibly Justin at some point after this meeting to go over costs so we have hard costs for what it is moving forward. If you're supplying the bandwidth from existing connections, um, the cost between what they're currently uh, supporting right now and the difference between that would be the actual number you guys would need to to think about you know i don't know how that works but uh 
And and when I and when, I'm sorry, this is Bill Moore. And what I was suggesting was that we make the move right now. We currently are with Xfinity or Comcast uh, here at the town offices, and you know that we would increase our backbone here at the town office in the heart of this to the one gig service. And that my understanding, coupled with other people's existing internet, that that would be robust enough to supply this entire network. Uh, with you know that we would have that people would be able to have a landing page when they came here to town when they were looking when they were looking for uh, you know looking they would look up and they'd see our wi-fi and they'd have a landing page it would take them to the chamber it would take them to our town uh, our town web page and would provide them with the internet so they could do what they needed to do and like that again between from what Justin and i talked about that that gigabit service that we'd have here plus whatever we were I guess, leeching off of what we our existing networks are, including the town hall, which has a basic internet package, mm-hmm. including some of these other access points, that that would be enough. So the increase in cost with us would be the difference between what we were paying for Comcast right now, which is somewhere in the neighborhood of 200, 250 bucks a, uh, a month to $600 is the last quote I got from the president of VTEL for us to have that gigabit up and down here at the town offices to back, be the backbone. Things so, could get better in the future too. I mean, you guys might, you might find yourself being offered higher speeds by the existing ISPs that, you know, things can change in the future. Um, but you would definitely need to consider what the connections are that are supporting this and how much they cost in addition to what's already being paid. So if you had somebody like Foley Tacos hosting an access point, um, and they have a 300 megabit plan. The difference in that would be whatever 60, 80 dollars they're paying versus 120. So it wouldn't be 120 dedicated to each exact, you know, for each available access point or each gateway. And depending on how we construct this thing, there's a lot of flexibility. So we could use, you know, out of six access points, we could use three gateways instead of having all six of them be gateways. Have three of them be repeaters, three of them be gateways. So there's some flexibility for it. There's definitely a way to, to minimize that cost, that overhead. Have these have these proposed hosts been con- been consulted? Yes. Yes. So the, ones you've, the ones you've listed are on board. So fo- yes, Foley Taco and Bean, the Church, yes, Town Hall, yes, Brandon, the Douglas House, yes. This guy here was going to be just an outside repeater with no internet access. And fully talk on bean as well. Yes. It seems like there were two kinds of costs here, Seth. And I think that's why the nature of the motion, it's important to recognize that there's, there's the internet provision, which is um, the part that could cost a lot if we want to provide very, very fast service everywhere. Um, but there's also just the basic hardware infrastructure that if we're going to have internet at all, we need to have this backbone. And I think that's why I'm promoting that we get on Justin's list and um, and authorize this so we can have that basic backbone. And then if we want to discuss the level of service we're going to provide, I think that's a fruitful discussion about how much we're going to put into, um, uh, you know, bandwidth. I've seen so many people come from so far out. There's There are so many people who are not served with Internet even if there's internet at all and it's not stellar, like it would be at, you know, uh, at an airport, um, people really appreciate being able to come into town, check email and do things that they do not have the ability to do where they live on DSL um, when they cannot afford cell phones with data plans. Um, you know, as, from, an, from an economic development point of view, the splash page is the ability to direct uh, people to, to, other businesses and, and downtown, um, whatever, if you guys are hosting a concert or something, you can promote things that are happening in your community and use that. You have a captive portal to have people's eyes see that and they'll use it. But also it really does, you know, from a public service perspective, it makes a huge difference in people's lives. Even one, just one access point. You can see the amount of traffic that comes in and out of that thing and unique visitors that go to it. People figure out that it's there and they come from, pretty far away to use these things, which was the whole point of putting them up in the first place. So, but I do understand there's consideration that you guys want to make something 
that is big and is powerful, then there's expense associated with the internet connection part of it. That would be your basic recurring, your biggest recurring revenue problem. I guess I, I have concerns, not just about the expense. I have concerns about, you know, are we relying on someone else's modem? Are we relying on someone else's, you know, good payment history with their service provider? Are we relying on, do they all have to have the same service provider? I think that there's a number of questions and I would, uh, I, I don't feel a sense of great urgency to jump in on this hardware and then figure out the bandwidth and That's how valid. I mean, that, that is absolutely valid. So long as the power stays on on one of these things, the mesh network works such that one of them will turn into a repeater. And there's a the, the star pattern that's drawn on that map, that confusing bunch of lines, that shows you how each one of the devices is in contact and communication with all of the other devices within line of sight and sometimes out of line of sight. If somebody doesn't pay their internet bill, they're going to get free internet backhaul through the rest of the mesh network on their device. That's how it's going to work. And so we would know that we would see that it's down. Somebody presumably would be able to go to talk to them and be like, Hey, we noticed that you're no longer acting as a gateway. Your device is a repeater. Is there a technical problem or have you guys decided to no longer support the network or what, what, you know, what have you. But as far as uh, the, the functioning of the, it would continue to function in that they would just use other gateways. It's self self healing is what they call it, but that's it. Just self configures it. It turns itself into a repeater if you stop connecting to the internet. As long as the power stays on. So from a from a user point of view, like I recognize that you know I'm five foot seven, and most of our internet use probably happens at um, a normal height off of street level, mm -hmm. but. Is this not like cell phones where it's beneficial to have it higher up than to have it lower? <clears throat> the, only, the only consideration we've ever used uh, for height is to put it at about 12 feet up in the air so it doesn't get vandalized. But in 15 years, I've never had one of these things vandalized. And I think you know the, your, your target audience for vandals is probably the teenagers or somebody, and I think they'd be loath to knock down a device that gives them free internet. Not, not, but, but I'm just asking, there's, there's no benefit to have it in a higher building no. than in a lower building. It's exactly what, what you said is you're, the plane that you're at is where you want to put the access point. The antennas that are on these things are dipole antennas, which mean they broadcast in a radiating pattern from the center of the antenna with a little horn antenna. So if you put it up here, you know, and you have somebody walking around down here, it's going to be weaker down here than it would be right up here at the same level. So you really want to kind of keep these things at the same plane that everybody's using them. And uh, you wouldn't get any better service out of it if you got further up. They do reach a fair distance, though. I mean, you get 100% signal at 350 feet. And me and Bill were able to get a, a signal off of the one that's at the town hall, the one with the big columns. And we were at least 500 feet away from that thing. We were able to use the internet pretty, pretty effectively, actually. I, uh, I, I wonder, could we ask if Dave might um, talk with the DBA in the chamber and see if there's any interest in collaborating that way? Or does anybody have thoughts about developing this further in that direction? Maybe not. Uh, well, actually, we have a chamber board of directors member who's also a select board member. How do you feel about it, Brian? Uh, a lot of unknowns right now, and I'm kind of against it. Is Bernie still on or not? No. So, so actually, could you be more clear? Are you, are, are you saying you're against having downtown Wi-Fi, or are you saying you're against um, the uh, this particular estimate of um, equipment? I, go, I got to believe the estimate will be lower. I think that the project will come in higher than what the estimate says for some reason, and it'll get more expensive every year. And I'm just against the project right now. Too many unknowns. Hmm. I, <clears throat> I'm... I'm going to chime in too. I'm not really for it at this point in time. Um, 
uh, we're we're helping uh, most of our most of our constituents aren't in that purple area right here. I I understand, but I at this point in time I'm I'm not ready for it. I think I need to sleep on this a little bit or chew on it a little bit more myself. I, I, I consider it an economic development um, necessity for our, 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 our downtown. Um, and so um, I, 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 I agree that it is, Tim, but there's a lot more. There's a lot more to our downtown and there's a lot more to our town of Brandon and our economic development than just that little area there is right that we're looking at. And like I said, I for me to vote on it tonight, I'm I'm not going to vote on it. I'm going to if I do if I vote, I'm going to vote nay. Um whatever way it goes from here and until I can do a little more research and yep. count myself, I guess. Yeah. That's valid. <laughs> if you guys don't have place it as a priority for the, for the town, I mean, I put one up in Bethel. It gets tons of uh, use by people from the surrounding area. Um, I paid for it out of pocket just because I live in Bethel and I wanted Bethel to have something nice. Uh, and, and that's it. I consider it something that puts a, a good face forward for my town, but I could see where if you guys don't feel that it's useful for your town, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have a way to sell it to you. So I, I would like to just, um, say that I think it is useful for the town. I think it will be economic development. I think that eventually we will support something of this nature. I just would like the board to have a fuller amount of information regarding what we're getting into in terms of the relationships we've got to have and what that means for the technology and in terms of what we're talking about um, in terms of providers. It sounds like the town might be already in a position where we're changing internet providers perhaps. Um, and if that's the case, then maybe we should wait and see that that relationship works and that that service is um, robust enough. And I, I think that that would be more informative to me than, you know, let's, let's buy the equipment right now and then figure out later what we're going to put into it. I, I, I don't feel like, like this is ready, and I, but I do feel like it's going to happen and I'll support it happening. And I, 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 I agree with Seth. I mean, I, I think it's something that we probably need for economic development, but I'm just, uh, I'm not, I'm not ready to vote on it at this point in time here tonight. Um, Tim, I think the motion will fail. Do you want to withdraw it? Well, well, before we, we finish this, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Bill made the suggestion that um, this could fall under some of the ARPA money. And, um, and I'm wondering if we want to at least give um, some kind of, um, you know, green light to Bill to at least pursue uh, the idea to see a fact if there can be some some outside money that might help um, um, ease this decision on the board. Bill, did you have thoughts about that suggestion? I serve at your will. So whatever you guys want me to do, I will do. Uh, I, th I think, you know, we generally don't direct uh, Bill uh, or the other department heads. Uh, we, have a, we have a good relationship with the town manager, and that's probably the appropriate place for us to make a suggestion. So um, I, I think, Dave, you might be hearing the consensus of the board that the board would like a little bit more information, including about funding sources and, and ongoing maintenance and uh, carrying costs, so forth. I would be more than happy to inve investigate this further. I think, I think, if I may speak, you guys, uh, due diligence would be a good idea. There is a component of the, uh, the license that provides for support. Um, Cisco offers 24 7, 365 phone support like that. You call up if you have a problem and they, they will walk you through anything that goes on with it. That's kind of part of the, the, why, the reason why these networks are very popular is that they allow people who don't have uh, IT backgrounds to be able to manage and troubleshoot them. Uh, the visibility means you can just log in and take a look at what the problem is and it notifies you if there's anything going on. Uh, they're very, very, very user-friendly, very manageable, and they come with support included. My company um, warranties the hardware for life. 
So if you have a lightning storm and it fries one of these things, you don't have to buy another one. I just replace it out of my, there's a one year warranty from the company, but it's outdoor hardware. All of their indoor hardware carries a lifetime warranty. So through my company, I bring that into compliance and I just say lifetime warranty for all of the hardware. We've never had one be fried by, by any kind of electrical problems or anything. So that's uh but there is a support element included in it. I didn't even touch on that because it really gets into the technical details. So I think that if you guys want to meet up and discuss this more, I think that would be prudent. Further contributions, further questions? Tim, what do you feel about your motion? Do you want to, you want to bring it to a vote or not? Um, you know, I, I, um, having a vote wouldn't hurt. Um, it's just another statement uh, that shows up in our notes. And um, I don't think it'll be productive, Tim. I don't think it'll be productive to your end goal. Um, I don't think you want the board on the record in a vote as being opposed three to one to something that eventually we do want to support. Um, okay. Okay, and do you withdraw the motion? Sure. Okay. Anything else to be said on that? Okay. I, I, I do look forward to, and I'm sure the whole board looks forward to getting some more info on that. Uh, and I, I uh, hope that, I'm sure that Dave will foresee a lot of the board's um, questions and when he does the research. So thank you for taking that on. And Bill, thank you for taking it on. Uh, and Justin, thank you for being here tonight too. Uh, so pleasure. thank you guys for the consideration. I mean, thank you, Mr. Thank Chair. You. Okay. Item 10, uh, there's some swamp lot bid results and uh, Dave sent this to us uh, with a little cover sheet. Um, did everybody get that? All the board members get that today. So we have two swamp lots, they're number 6-01-23 of 7.31 acres and number 6-01-32 of approximately 10 acres. And we have two bids. So Dave, do you want to introduce uh, what, what's going on here? Sure. Um, we did a bid opening at two o'clock last Friday and there were sealed bids. These are only two that were received. Um, and that's really about it. There's not much more to it. These were the ones that the Nature Conservancy was going to purchase last year and then they bailed out because they didn't like our language and our deed. So, um, here we are again. Are we going to state the bid amounts for the record? Yeah. Sure. Um, I yeah. The one, the Dave, one. I think there's a mistake in the uh, the tally up. I think it's thirteen hundred dollars from Mr. Wallace. My Friday afternoon math was incorrect. <laughs> right. Yep. Eight. I think you're right. <laughs> um. So we, we, we got a bid from uh, uh, H. John C. Wallace for $1,300 and one that I assume is from Lynn Demeray. She dropped it off when I wasn't here and um, no name on the envelope, no name on the letter, but um, for $690. What's the pleasure of the board? I make a motion. We take the $1,300 bid. Second. Motion from Mr. Wyman and a second from Mr. Coolidge to accept the bid from H. Chauncey Wallace for thirteen hundred dollars for the uh, a total of thirteen hundred dollars for the two swamp lots that were referenced. Is there discussion? There is not. All in favor of accepting the bids from H. Chauncey Wallace, say aye. 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 That's unanimous. Item 11, is there a motion regarding the warrant? I'll make the motion to accept the warrant, $1,101,045.25. Well put, is there a second? Second. Second from Mr. Wyman. Mr. Atherton. Just so you know, the um, 1 million portion of it is to Otter Valley Unified School District. I didn't think it was to you, Dave. 
<laughs> any questions on any of the bills? If not, ready to vote. All in favor of approval of the warrant as presented, say aye. 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 It's unanimous. Any announcements or suggestions for the good of the town? Yeah. Charlene. Could I just clarify the um, the lot number? Um, I just wanted to make sure I had the I had the six dash oh one dash twenty three, and then yep. dash oh one dash was it thirty two? It says thirty two on the bid document. Yes. Okay. Just wanted to make sure. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Nothing else to be said. Uh, is there a motion to adjourn? Make that motion. Sorry. Is there a second? Motion and a second, it's not debatable. All in favor of adjourning at 841, say aye. 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 Thank aye. you very much.